Hey folks, this is Riker, and we've had a crazy week for video games. The Baldur's Gate 3 studio head is pissed. We've got devs telling executives to eat crap. Dragon's Dogma 2's release has been a disaster, in part due to corporate greed. And that's really the running theme of today's video. Corporate greed. Games getting absolutely ruined because of greedy executives. But we're actually seeing a glimmer of hope in one of the unlikeliest of places. We might be seeing the first signs of Blizzard starting to heal now that Bobby Kotick is gone. We'll talk about all that and more in today's video. It's a big one. It's been a big news week. But before we move on, just a quick word from this video's sponsor, Incogni. You ever wonder how you get spam calls, texts, and emails? It's because thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data, and it's all legal. However, you have the right to demand that a data broker deletes whatever personal information they may have about you. Now, realistically, for you to track down and contact all the companies to make that request, it's just not reasonable unless you got a ton of free time. And that's where Incogni comes in. It's a service that does all of that for you. It reaches out to the data brokers on your behalf, requests that your data be removed, and deals with any pushback they may give. And you'd be surprised at how much of your personal information may be out there. Not just your full name, email, and phone number, but also things like your employment history, your home address, your relatives, maybe even your social security number. So here's my Incogni dashboard. You can see I've got 15 requests in progress and 40 have been completed. I've been using Incogni for about a year now after I'd started getting a lot of spam texts. I'm not sure what started it. I don't know if it's because I signed up for some store's loyalty card or because of a big data breach. I know LinkedIn has repeatedly had data of hundreds of millions of its users scraped and sold on the dark web. For anyone who does a lot of online shopping, that's a ton of opportunity for your info to get out there and spread around. But I know that after using Incogni, now that I think back on how frustrating the situation was over a year ago, it is now unusual for me to get a spam message. So take back your data, stop the spam, go to incogni.com slash Riker and use code Riker to get an exclusive offer of 60% off. That's incogni.com slash R-H-Y-K-K-E-R and use code Riker or click the link below to take your personal data off the market. So kicking things off with some Baldur's Gate 3 news. Hasbro, the owners of Wizards of the Coast, who are the owners of Dungeons and Dragons, has recently expressed that Baldur's Gate 3 proved that there's a market demand for great D&D games. I mean, yeah, it made them many, many millions of dollars. But I think I chalk that more up to Larian making an absolutely phenomenal game, more so than just interest in D&D. And I say this as someone who, D&D is my greatest hobby. People think it's Diablo, it's, it's, it's Dungeons and Dragons. So Hasbro is building up their own internal AAA dev studios to make more games. And they have one, quote, really, really cool D&D game already in the works. Now, as a reminder, Larian, an external studio, was given the license by Hasbro to make Baldur's Gate 3, which is under the umbrella of Dungeons and & Dragons, and that's made Hasbro $90 million. So, naturally, Hasbro laid off most of the Wizards of the Coast staff that had worked with Larian to make the game happen. And in what is, I'm sure, completely unrelated news, at GDC 2024 this week, Larian studio head Sven Vink said, quote, Greed has been effing this whole thing up for so long, since I started. I've been fighting publishers my entire life, and I keep on seeing the same, same, same mistakes over and over and over. It's always the quarterly profits. The only thing that matters are the numbers. And then you fire everybody, and then the next year you say, Crap, I'm out of developers. And then you start hiring people again. And then you do acquisitions, and then you put them in the same loop again, and it's just broken. You don't have to. You can make reserves. Just slow down a bit. Slow down on the greed. Be resilient. Take care of the people. Don't lose the institutional knowledge that's been built up in the people you lose every single time. So you have to go through the same cycle over and over and over. It really pisses me off. I just love Vink. Every time we hear this guy talk, I think this is the most candid we've seen him just absolute lay in to what a lot of gamers uh, have been complaining about for a long time. This is how we want to hear a studio head talk. It was just two months ago that we spoke about him standing up to Ubisoft greed. 
Check out that video in case you haven't seen it. Now, after Vink made these comments at GDC, we also learned conclusively that Larian will not be making any DLC or expansions for Baldur's Gate 3, nor will they make Baldur's Gate 4. Vink confirmed that his studio plans to move away from Dungeons & Dragons entirely and do something new, leaving the D&D IP with Wizards of the Coast. Now, saying these things in this order sequentially certainly paints a picture that Hasbro must have pissed Vink off so bad that he has cut all ties with them. But when speaking with IGN later, Vink clarified some points. And he also dropped the fact that they actually had begun work on Baldur's Gate 3 DLC. Speaking of IGN, Vink brought up the difficulties in working with the D&D 5th edition framework as a basis for a video game. There's just a lot more you can do with combat if you're not constrained to a tabletop game's rules. But because of the success of Baldur's Gate 3, they kind of felt like they had to do DLC, and they even started thinking of Baldur's Gate 4. However, quote, You can see the team was doing it because everyone felt like we had to do it, but it wasn't really coming from the heart, and we're very much a studio from the heart. After Vink took some vacation time for Christmas, he came back to the studio with his mind made up. He told the team they're not going to do it. Instead, they're going to go back to working on things they talked about before they started work on Baldur's Gate 3. There's two games that they wanted to make. And to Vink's surprise, his team was elated by this news. Everyone was on the same page. Quote, We didn't have any antagonism against Baldur's Gate 4 or DLC, but the heart wasn't there. It was more routine work than actually being excited. Now we have the excitement back in the room, and that's a big, important thing. Vink says that the next game won't be Divinity Original Sin 3, and that it will be, quote, different than what you think it is, but that it'll still be familiar. We know from previous interviews that the second game, the one coming after this one, is an RPG that will dwarf the scope of Baldur's Gate 3, which is crazy because that game is already massive. So, as much as people want there to be drama between Hasbro and Larian, I guess, you know, who knows? Could be that Vink doesn't want to so obviously throw shade at Hasbro, but it could also be, you know, Larian's heart maybe was no longer in it to do the DLC in Baldur's Gate 4 because of the relationship with Hasbro, because the people that they were working on, the people they had a relationship at Wizards of the Coast with, all got laid off. Who knows what other pressure Hasbro might have put on them when talking about a DLC or a Baldur's Gate 4. Vink was certainly speaking very passionately at GDC, and things were lining up just a little too coincidentally, maybe. But in the meantime, Larian has confirmed they will keep working on content for Baldur's Gate 3, just not something big like a DLC. They are still bringing cross-platform mod support, and the director of publishing even hinted at more things lined up. Maybe some free extra story content? We could only hope. And Vink wasn't even the only one to call out corporate greed at GDC. The developer of Dwarf Fortress didn't hold anything back when talking about the execs that do these mass layoffs in the industry, saying they can all eat crap and that they're horrible, bad people. Then in other news this week, we had a major upset. Dragon's Dogma 2 released yesterday. Now, reviews went up a bit earlier this week and they were looking phenomenal. On Open Critic, we saw a top critic average score of 89 out of 100, with 96% of critics recommending the game. Awesome, right? It sounded like the game was catering to both hardcore fans of Dragon's Dogma, while also addressing all the biggest criticisms of the first game that may have turned people off from it. The only sign of any possible negativity was when a couple reviews mentioned some slight performance issues. And, well, you know, when reviewers are talking about slight performance issues in a AAA release, that basically means that there's going to be a lot of players that are going to have severe performance issues. Well, more sources started to chime in on performance issues, in particular on PC, but with big spikes happening on console as well. Developer Capcom then released a statement acknowledging the frame rate issues on PC and that they were looking into fixes. But as the extent of the performance issues started to become clear that the game just wasn't well optimized at all, it started to bring into question why reviewers don't value this more in their scores. Imagine you have a game that is a perfect 10 out of 10 in every way. Story, art, gameplay, just everything, but the performance is terrible. Imagine you're only getting 5 FPS. Well, honest question to you, not rhetorical, what, what score, what final score would you give that game? I'm not saying Dragon's Dogma 2 has 5 FPS, don't get me wrong. 
It's definitely not as bad as that. But I'm using an extreme example to explore where do we draw the line. Then the game releases fully to the public and the situation gets worse, much worse. On top of performance issues, players realize there's no easy way to actually start a second playthrough. You only have one save file, and if you want to make another character, you basically need to go into the file structure and delete your current save. Meaning console players can't even do it at all. But no big deal, right? I mean, who even wants to start a second character or another playthrough in a role-playing game? But that's not the worst of it. The worst is when players saw the egregiously money-grubbing microtransactions that were tacked on into a single-player RPG with no multiplayer or co-op at all. You can spend between $1 and $5 on a whole host of things, including character editing, resurrections, even fast travel. There's dozens of MTX items, and a lot of these things are just petty. You can farm them in-game with relative ease, to the point that you wonder why they even let you spend real money on them. Now, not all of them are super easy to farm. Some of the reviewers who played the game in full, beginning to end, said that a couple of the items you can spend real money on are truly rare to find in-game. Now, we can have the discussion on whether this qualifies as pay to win or not all day. In the end, it doesn't matter. Best case scenario here, okay, you can get all this stuff in-game for free. Meaning what? There's no reason to buy these things? Okay, so if there's no reason to buy these things, why did you put them in the game as MTX? Did they really make MTX that they thought no one would buy? If there truly is no reason to buy these things, then that means they're basically preying on ignorant people who don't realize that there's no reason to buy these things. That's your best case scenario. Is that a good look? Yeah, we put in these MTX to exploit stupid people. You know, back in my day, Devs also put things into single-player games that players can use to resurrect or fast travel or otherwise make the game easier or less grindy or less tedious. They were called cheat codes, and they were free. Power overwhelming, black sheep wall. Because I bought your product, and I should be allowed to enjoy that product however I want to. As long as I'm not negatively impacting anyone else's fun, like in a multiplayer environment. I'm playing my solo game by myself, let me use my cheat codes for free. <laughs> when you're nickel and diming players over the pettiest of gameplay elements, we're basically one step away on that slippery slope towards the nightmarish gaming dystopia envisioned by former EA boss John Richitello, in which you gotta pay a dollar to reload your weapon. Now, things became even worse when you consider the fact that the director of Dragon's Dogma 2 told IGN before the game's release, quote, travel is boring? That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. This is in the context of talking about fast travel. Players want fast travel because travel is boring. So travel isn't boring, but for $3, here's a fast travel token. Hmm. So suffice it to say, the Steam reviews have been mostly negative. And following the backlash over everything, Capcom issued an official statement on Steam saying that they're looking into adding a feature to the Steam version of the game that will allow players that are already playing to restart the game. Yeah, thanks. They're also looking into ways to improve performance in the future. All right. And they basically pointed out that a lot of the items that you can spend real money on, you can also get in game. Yeah, we know. It just came off as kind of tone deaf. But I turn the question to you folks. What are your thoughts on all this? Are these business practices acceptable? Is this no big deal? Am I making too much of this? Also, how much should performance be weighed into a game review? And if you've tried Dragon's Dogma 2, what are your impressions? Sound off in the comments. Then in some Overwatch 2 news, we got good news and bad news. Which you want to hear first, okay? Bad news it is. You know how the entire point of making Overwatch 2 was to have the PvE missions and campaign? Yeah. Well. Kotaku's been speaking to some former Overwatch 2 devs, and things are looking grim. We first learned about Overwatch 2 in 2019, and the PvE was arguably its main selling point. They were turning Overwatch 1 into Overwatch 2, and they said they needed to do this in order to release the PvP. But ever since Overwatch 2's launch in October 2022, 
we've only got one single set of PvE missions in August 2023, with no word on when more can be expected. Well, following the layoffs at Blizzard in January of this year, it seems the part of the Overwatch 2 team most hit by these layoffs was the PvE missions team. So, yeah. If the PvE missions aren't cancelled altogether at this point, they certainly are not a priority. And just to clarify, although these layoffs happened after the Microsoft acquisition, my understanding is that they were planned while still under Activision and Bobby Kotick. That'll be relevant in a bit. So again, Kotaku spoke to some former Overwatch 2 devs who shed some light on what the heck happened. Now, apparently the original plan was to release Overwatch 2's PvE campaign in multiple content drops over several years, with three missions releasing every 18 months, which is insane to me. That's just way too little content with way too much time between them to maintain any kind of momentum. The project was apparently also stuck in development hell because of higher-ups wanting to ensure Blizzard quality and having people basically redo things over and over and unable to make any uh, strong executive decisions on something and this is causing a lot of frustration in the team. So apparently every mission, every single mission in the campaign was in some phase of development from either fully playable or just still in concept. So a lot of work had been done. Now, it turned out to be a big challenge to convert Overwatch's PvP gameplay into something that worked well in PvE because a lot of the hero, at least in part, because a lot of the hero kits are designed for PvP play. So that's all understandable. There would be challenges in converting the format. But meanwhile, on a bigger scale, it was always understood within the team that PvP was still the core of the game. But everyone, including leadership uh, within Overwatch, still cared about the PvE mode. Now, apparently, Activision needed to see the first set of story missions pull serious numbers in order to justify letting the team complete the campaign. And apparently, those missions did not do well at all. It's no surprise then that six months later, the PvE team is basically laid off. So, where does that leave us? Bobby Kotick had a final F you to Overwatch fans on his way out. Even if the team wanted to continue the PvE campaign at this point, the people who were working on it are all gone. They'd have to invest even more resources into getting new people, getting them brought up to speed, and basically having to redo a bunch of work on a project that was already very challenging to complete, and I just don't see this happening. At the end of the day, Overwatch 2 was just a way to more aggressively monetize Overwatch by removing loot boxes that you can earn for free and introduce a battle pass that sells new heroes. But that leads us on to the good news. It was announced this week that heroes will once again be free for everyone. Just like in the Overwatch 1 days, no longer locked behind the battle pass. This is going to start with Season 10, which will introduce a new hero, and the change is being retroactively implemented to previous heroes as well meaning all the Overwatch 2 heroes that were previously behind those paywalls will now be freely available to all players. The Overwatch team giving the FU back to Bobby Kotick. All Mythic skins will also be available. Premium coins will now be available in the free and paid battle passes rather than attainable via the weekly challenges, not in addition to. So what this means is you can now earn more premium coins than you could before, but you're still not earning enough to buy the next battle pass baby steps, baby steps, but overall it is a lot easier to earn these coins now. So, I think this is a sign of Blizzard healing. Bobby Kotick is gone, and all of a sudden, some monetization changes are reverted, some more consumer-friendly practices are implemented into the game. Is it perfect? No. Is it a huge step in a better direction? Yes. And that actually leads us into some Diablo 4 news. Recently, we got word from Blizzard that the product team will be looking to discount more items in the in-game shop in the coming weeks and months. And they also hinted at potential other shop changes. Now, cynically, you can argue that this is a sign that shop items are not selling well. Sure, that's one way to interpret it. But it could also be a sign that with Kodak gone, there's less pressure on the monetization team and they can start lowering prices since... Yeah, those skins are pretty damn expensive. They can't just do a full 180 overnight. Microsoft bought this company with the expectation of certain sales projections that were given to them by Activision, etc. But I think the rest of 2024 will tell us a lot about what was Activision and what was Blizzard. 
But the biggest Diablo 4 news this week, of course, came from the Campfire chat, revealing the big itemization rework that the dev team has been cooking up. And it's been a huge win. Faith in Diablo 4 had been at an all-time low, and this really exceeded a lot of people's expectations. Everything they revealed will make the game significantly better. More fun, more interesting. Diablo 4 is a game with flaws, and itemization was one of its biggest. And they are completely reworking itemization into something that is looking like a strong system, complete with a bunch of new crafting options. We're also getting new endgame, basically greater rifts, which has been another community complaint. They're improving Hell Tides by basically incorporating everything good about Season 2 Blood Tides into them. We're getting uber uber bosses as more pinnacle endgame content, nerfs to the overpowered barbarian stuff, minions getting buffed across the board. They reworked the Codex of Power and Aspects. You won't be extracting Aspects anymore and cluttering up your stash. All Aspects will go straight into the Codex of Power. And there won't be minimum values anymore. You get to forever keep the value that you extract. So once you find a max roll on an aspect, you are done. You never have to farm that aspect again. Huge, huge quality life change. Stash space won't be a problem anymore. Also, they're letting us zoom out the camera more, something many players have been asking for since day one. Now, of course, we just learned about all this stuff in theory. We'll have to try it out for ourselves in practice when PTR launches. But this is really promising. I know we say this every season, but even a lot of the haters are now admitting that season four is looking to be the best season yet. We may finally reach a point where we don't have to fix things anymore and we can just be adding content to expand endgame, expand build options, just grow things out rather than rework the foundation. Be sure to check out my video on the campfire going over all the juicy details. In other Blizzard news this week, out of nowhere, Blizzard dropped a limited time 60 player battle royale mode for World of Warcraft. Called Plunderstorm, it's available for any active WoW player, classic or retail, and you don't need the latest expansion either. You can play solo or duos, matches last up to 10 to 15 minutes. You do have to create a new character for this, you can't bring in your existing characters, and there are cosmetics to earn. Now, opinions seem kind of split on Plunderstorm itself, which is to be expected. Battle Royale isn't for everyone, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay if not every part of every game is designed for every player, as long as every player has enough content in the game for them. But on the initial Plunderstorm announcement, the trailer was massively downvoted on YouTube. And I believe the reason why isn't so much because Blizzard brought up Battle Royale to World of Warcraft almost 10 years too late, but rather because they've been hyping up this pirate content drop for a while now. Back in December, when they laid out their roadmap, they placed a mysterious pirate flag next to this week's update without saying a peep more. This led to intense community speculation about what pirate content we may be getting, and no one was guessing a Battle Royale mode. Then, just a few days before the drop, Blizzard changed their World of Warcraft social media profile picture to a pirate flag. Again, building up all the hype. So, yeah, when you... <laughs> then reveal a feature that isn't for everyone, well, the people that don't want a battle royale, that just want to play World of Warcraft, they're not going to be happy. I do think it's great that Blizzard is experimenting with new stuff in WoW. I think a lot of people are enjoying it a lot. I just think they should have stealth dropped this out of nowhere without teasing it first, and then it would have been much better received. Now, one thing to remember is that Blizzard bought Proletariat in summer 2022, and that's a, the developer of Spellbreak, which was a unique fantasy mage-based battle royale. They put them to work on World of Warcraft, and clearly this is the result. Then in some last epoch news, we got a patch this week with some bug fixes, including a fix that nerfed the Ballista skill. Prior to issuing the patch, however, the devs did communicate this upcoming nerf, starting by reminding us that they had a community survey, and the results were that players do want to see bug fixes to bugs that are leading to something in the game overperforming. In this case, we all saw how the Ballista had absolute screen-clearing builds at endgame. The devs looked into it and realized there was a bug with the armed construction node on the Ballista skill, which causes your Ballistas to explode when they expire or are destroyed. One part of the node has the size of the explosion scale with your dexterity. But while the text says that the area would scale with the dexterity, it was actually the radius scaling with dexterity. 
meaning the explosions were over twice as big as they should have been. So again, they announced days in advance that they'd be fixing this bug so that the node properly scales with area as stated in the tooltip. This doesn't kill the build at all, it just makes it a bit less redonkulous. The dev team also released this week a post-mortem on the online launch issues with the game. And I think with this, we got one of the most in-depth, candid looks at what happens behind the scenes with a game launch possibly ever. In the 2000 word blog post, they start by saying how over 1.4 million players logged in during the first week, with 265,000 concurrent players at their peak. But they wanted to talk about what went wrong and why. Why couldn't their servers handle all the incoming players? Why couldn't they just buy more servers or otherwise throw money at the problem to fix things? Well, they explained how, from the time you first log in to selecting a character to joining a game server, you're interacting with a half dozen online services, all operating behind the scenes. And for some of those services, it's difficult to design them in a way that they can easily scale up by just having more. The team had done robust testing for months before launch. The week before launch, they thought they were safe. But then, come launch morning, when they went to scale up their servers, surprise, surprise, only half the servers they requested spun up. Something was suddenly failing unexpectedly. On top of that, in an unrelated problem, their service host had an incident the night before that hadn't yet resolved by that morning, and that prevented the team from using the tools they normally use to make changes to the backend. So during the time when they most needed to go in and make emergency fixes, their ability to do so was killed due to factors outside of their control. They did have workarounds to get in there, but these workarounds meant things would take significantly longer to fix. They were mere minutes before launch, and they estimated that they could only handle up to 150,000 concurrent players before their systems would begin to fail. And, well, we all know what happened. They suffered from success. So, over the course of the next five days, they were constantly deploying emergency fixes to a series of cascading failures in their systems. The servers were under up to five times the expected load because what happens when players fail to connect? They keep spamming over and over and over trying to reconnect, which just puts the servers under even more stress. Then, when one service succeeds, all of a sudden you have this big influx of players smashing through to the next service and bringing the next service down, and so on and so on. In any case, that's just a small part of the story. They have the whole thing laid out in the blog post. The bottom line here, multiplayer server infrastructure is super challenging. But everything has worked out in the end. All right, in some Helldivers 2 news, we've had another eventful week. First, some accolades. The game has likely sold over 8 million copies, according to industry analysts, and that's just on Steam. The game is available on PC and PS5, and PC accounts for, it's estimated, 60% of sales. So we probably have 11 to 12 million copies of the game sold altogether. And even though the game released in February, it is topping the charts as the best-selling premium game in the US of 2024 so far. This is a huge success for the devs. Helldivers 1 sold about 2 million copies over its entire lifetime. And Helldivers 2 is already at 5 times that number after under 2 months. Now, on top of the game just being incredibly fun, I've been sneaking evenings of Helldivers 2 with my friends, and honestly, it's the most fun that I've had in a video game in a long time. But on top of that, I think it's just an example, an excellent example, of live service done right. The term live service has come to have such a negative connotation, and we think of a live service game, we think of AAA companies trying to milk us with battle passes and MTX. And yeah, sure, Helldivers 2 does have MTX, and it has a battle pass. But it does so in the most ethical way that I think we've seen in a game in modern times. First off, the game is only $40, not $70. Second, the battle passes never go away. In other words, they're not psychologically preying upon you, making you feel like you must buy now or you will lose out on these items. Third, you got premium currency just playing the game normally. Pretty much every match you can farm premium currency. And you can farm up all the premium currency that you need to buy anything that you want eventually. You never have to spend a dime of real money on anything. And that just covers the monetization side of things. 
on the live service side of things, they have created a game in which the community feels like it is engaging in a part of a live, living, breathing ecosystem that responds to their actions. You have this massive galactic war campaign. All players contribute to liberating or defending planets. And as planets are lost or captured, and the narrative unfolds in response. Content drops are tied to this evolving narrative. The devs don't just release a patch that make mechs available to us. No, they tease them in the story ahead of time. They start to show them. They're appearing on maps. Oh, hey, what, what is this thing? Hey, I can actually get into this vehicle. Then they send us on missions to defend the planet that is producing the mechs. And we succeed on this mission as a community. And because we succeeded in defending this mech production facility, they're able to release the mechs into the game. And now all players can use mechs. It all feels very organic and immersive and like we as players are actively involved and part of how the game evolves. This is an experience that can only exist as a live service. It's not a game with a live service tacked on to make more money. This is the model at its best. And speaking of the war efforts, well, we've been seeing some tremendous successes against the vile alien bugs. We were smashing major order after major order, liberating planets in the name of democracy with such efficiency that it felt like the Game Master Joel couldn't keep up with us. Well, we got cocky. After another major victory, taking planets Fenrir, Meridia, Turing, Irada, Estanu, and Heath, all in just a few days, we were all celebrating, high-fiving each other like we were unstoppable. We got complacent. We lost planet Istanu. Eh, no big deal. We'll take it back. Insignificant planet, not part of any major operation. But then the new major order came in. We had to liberate Fori Prime and Zagon Prime. And we had three days to do it. Now here's the problem. You can't just go straight to those planets. See, the game has supply lines to planets. You need to have a clear supply line meaning you might need to liberate certain planets along the way to get to a planet. And in these cases, at minimum, we needed to liberate four planets in total. Well, it would have been four planets if we hadn't just lost Estanu. Whoops. Five planets. Five planets to liberate in three days. This is probably the single most challenging major order we've ever received since the game launched. Players began to strategize the most optimal vector of attack to getting to Zagon, the most distant planet. But how do you ensure a community of players follows a plan? There was a most efficient path to take of planets to tackle in a specific order. And as long as everyone followed that plan, maybe, maybe we stood a chance. As long as we didn't divide our efforts attacking two different war fronts. But how do you ensure efforts are not wasted? How do you ensure that we can all collectively focus on a specific plan of attack? Well, if you know the answer, let me know because uh, we just flubbed it up. Bad. We took back Astana, we took Fori Prime, but with eight hours left to go, we were nowhere close to even starting to tackle Zagon, and the path to the planet was still blocked. We failed the Major Order. And after the failure, we were greeted by this message. Though many Terminids have been mercifully called, the Helldivers were unable to penetrate as far inside the quarantine zone as ordered. The expansion of our citizens to new planets will be reduced in line with the reduction of expected Element 710 to be produced. Further procreation applications will be denied until further notice. That's what happens when you fail a major order, folks. Your sexy time privileges are revoked. But the weird thing is that some players actually got a message saying that their major orders succeeded, that the planets were liberated. This caused some confusion, and in any other game, I would have assumed this was a bug. But in Helldivers? Who knows? Maybe this is part of the narrative. Maybe some dissidents have hacked our communications feed in order to feed us misleading propaganda for some anti-democratic purpose. And even if it is a bug, we may never know for sure, because the devs will certainly come back and frame it as part of the narrative. For instance, we had a patch deploy this week, which included bug fixes and balance changes to some planetary hazards, meteor showers and volcanoes got nerfed, and hazards will show up less frequently in, on missions in general. There's still going to be issues with uh, friend requests, sadly. Uh, hopefully they get re that resolved soon. But then, 
In game, players started to notice that no progress was being made in liberating planets. There was a bug that was preventing our progress either from being tracked or from us being able to make progress at all. And the devs acknowledged the bug in an in-universe message. And then once they fixed it, they communicated that to us with this message. Cybersecurity update. A recent system security breach has resulted in galactic war tables displaying inaccurate information. The breach has been addressed and all systems have been returned to normal operation. Any discrepancies are to be considered the result of dissident misinformation. Rest assured that the parties responsible have been identified, arrested, tried and executed. I just love how we're all part of this elaborate roleplay metagame. There's so many great memes in the community. It's just fun to even be part of the Helldivers community. Oh, and as a follow up on the flying bugs from last week. Well, the Ministry of Intelligence has officially acknowledged the existence of flying bugs with this message. Intelligence Brief. A new strain of flying terminids has suddenly appeared across all terminid planets, with no prior warning or indication of any kind. While the Ministry of Intelligence has always known this was a possibility, the abruptness of the evolution indicates a high possibility of dissident concealment. The deployment of Termicide was fortuitously timed. Doubtlessly, it averted an even worse evolution. Helldivers are advised to exterminate these mutations whenever encountered. Thank goodness for that termicide, folks. It did not cause the evolution. No, it prevented a worse one. And we'll wrap up Helldivers 2 news with word that we're also likely to be getting a level cap raise at some point in the future. Because when asked about the topic, a dev said, quote, There is a plan to raise the level cap. If, when, how, etc. is not something we've lifted the lid off of yet, though. Hypothetically speaking, though, we hope that Helldivers 2 will live for years. And to think that we'd keep the level cap for that amount of time feels not very likely. Not even plausible, I'd say, hypothetically. And lastly, in some Path of Exile news, we continue to get teasers leading up to the full reveal of the upcoming expansion, Necropolis. Again, this is the season of quality of life changes, but some of the changes go beyond that as well. We're actually seeing some great changes for solo self-found players. With every teaser, we were just seeing win after win after win for GGG as the devs were hitting upon all the issues players have been complaining about the most. All until the release of the Automation and Call to Arms Skill Gems teaser trailer, which was met with immense downvotes. Necropolis is adding two new skill gems to automate many instant skills and war cries, which is great. But they're doing this because they're removing the ability for players to bind instant skills to left click. And that got the community in an uproar. Because now, to basically achieve the same effect as before, you need to use one of these new automation gems, meaning you have to sacrifice another gem from your build for it. Now, for most builds, this actually isn't a huge deal. In fact, for some builds, it's an improvement now to run the automation gem. But summoner builds and mine users are really hurt by this. But once you got the expansion reveal, the devs addressed concerns here. The new Mine Mastery should provide the same functionality that Mine users have lost, and they're also now looking into ways to address minion build friction. But outside of that, the Necropolis reveal was a huge win. They seem to have crammed so much content in this expansion, and many people were expecting a weaker expansion because last one was so strong. Necropolis brings new pinnacle content in the form of Tier 17 maps multiple atlas passives, a scarab overhaul, new penultimate bosses, more transfigured gems, and more. The league mechanic involves carrying a lantern that lets you manipulate the enemies you'll encounter in the necropolis. You get to decide what buffs get assigned to what types of enemies. Then you bury corpses in the necropolis and exercise them to craft items. There's 14 new unique items, five of which are exclusive to the necropolis league, you'll unlock access to multiple Atlas passive trees. You can earn up to two extra trees by progressing through the Atlas. Overall, this league is looking really hype and it's releasing on March 29th. We also got this week a trailer for the Ranger in Path of Exile 2, an archer character that will likely be my main. Did I say that as well about the Marksman? Maybe I'll have many mains, I don't know. I like ranged characters, I like big bows and I cannot lie, and the WASD gameplay with the bow looks like such an improvement over the stutter step, wrist flicking that we've endured for 20 years. Also, I'm sorry, but is she riding a chicken dinosaur here? Do we have some kind of mount skill gem now? We did get a bit of bad news for PoE2 though. Beta has been delayed from June 7th to some undisclosed date later in the year. They said towards the end of the year. 
If I had to guess, I'll put the full release of PoE2 sometime in mid 2025 at the earliest, late Q2 at the earliest, but we'll see. And that's gonna wrap up this video. But do be sure to check out last week's video in which we discussed some exciting upcoming features for Last Epoch. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Special thanks to my supporters for making these videos possible and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.